My dear viewer, what would you do if you found out you weren't the biological parent of your own children? That your entire married life has been one big sham? Let's find out what the hero of this story did in this situation. And while you are listening to this story, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and put your most powerful like. I can't even believe that the twists and turns of my life can be turned into a movie. For more than 30 years, I believed that I had a happy marriage and three beloved children. I started my business with a modest service station, which has now turned into a convenience store. I may not be rich, but I managed to live comfortably. But a few years ago, my world was turned upside down when my 28-year-old son was hospitalized. He is married, has a spouse and two children. He was recently diagnosed with kidney problems. My wife Annabelle and I, whom I affectionately call Annie, were full of concern for our son's health. The doctors informed us that if the kidney problems persist, our son may need a transplant. Not knowing how to help our child, the doctor suggested contacting family members to find potential donors. Without hesitation, I underwent laboratory testing to make sure I was compatible in case my son needed a transplant. Unaware of this, I decided to donate a kidney to my son. I wanted to surprise the rest of the family with this news, but the test results showed that we were not suitable for each other. Confused, I questioned the doctor about the reasons for this discrepancy, especially since he was my own flesh and blood. I confessed to the doctor that I had drunk several bottles of beer, but at the same time made it clear that I did not smoke. Despite the doctor's embarrassment, I expressed my dissatisfaction and concern. In the end, the doctor asked me to come to his office for further conversation. I regret to inform you that, according to the results of the tests, you and your son are not a biological couple. I apologize for having to tell you this news, but it seems there may have been a mistake here. My team is currently retesting to confirm the results. When I left the office, I was overcome with despair. He has been my son for 28 years, and the idea that this is not true is difficult to comprehend. I decided not to share this information with Annie yet, in case there was a mistake. When I saw her, she knew something was wrong from the look on my face. As I sat in the waiting room with Annie and Gail, thoughts raced through my head. What about Janice, my eldest daughter, or Mandy, the little love of my life? Were they really my children? 26-year-old Janice and 20-year-old Mandy seemed so familiar and at the same time distant. I prayed that the doctor's diagnosis would be wrong. It's been two agonizing days since we learned the news, and I still couldn't get over it. The possible loss of my son and the uncertainty of his paternity weighed heavily on me. I was excited, hoping that he would tell me that the test results were wrong and my kidneys were in perfect condition. The news turned out to be better for Brad. His kidneys responded positively to the treatment. It looks like he won't need a transplant after all. Moreover, his body has adapted to the treatment so effectively that he can be discharged in a few days. He will need to monitor his diet, but otherwise a full recovery is expected. The joy for Brad was palpable among all those present. Tears were streaming down the faces of the women, and Annie was hugging me, and relief was visible on her face. I haven't revealed the test results to her yet, but I plan to discuss them with the doctor the next day. I asked Janice, Mandy, and Annie to donate a DNA sample, explaining that this was necessary so that the doctor could quickly prescribe treatment in case any of us had health problems like Brad's. Although Annie was a little apprehensive, she agreed to the test. The others did not hesitate and easily agreed to a simple mouth swab. Janice made sure that her children and husband took a DNA test to prepare for possible problems. The next day, I visited the hospital to hand over all the samples to the doctor, who told me the sad news that Brad and I are not biological relatives. I asked him to analyze all the samples and keep them in the archive so that other family members could contact them if necessary offering to pay the cost of the tests. When asked if his family members were among the samples, Mr. Weller confirmed that they were all members of his family, including his two daughters. I am concerned about the relationship between Janice and Mandy, who are my children 
grandchildren, children of my daughter, as well as my wife. Even though they are already adults, they have always been my children. A few days later, Brad was discharged from the hospital, and he had a week to recover before he returned to work. We were all grateful that he didn't need dialysis or a transplant. I tried my best to stay calm during this difficult time. I really wanted to make sure that these girls were really my daughters. Annie kept asking me about my strange behavior, wondering why I looked so detached. In response, I said that our shared experiences and our children strongly influence my thoughts, which was not entirely untrue. One evening, when I returned from work, I found Annie sitting at her desk, tears streaming down her face as she sorted through some papers. It was obvious that she had received the results of the examination at the hospital in the mail, and my heart was pounding with impatience. I decided to check my kidneys in order to donate them to my son in the future, considering that it is my duty as his father. But the doctor discovered that I am not his biological father. Not knowing the truth, I sent the test results to the girls. Annie informed me that Janice is not my daughter, and Mandy is mine. She was visibly upset when she shared the news with me. Feeling lost and not knowing what to do next, I stood in silence, unable to comprehend what was waiting for me. After three decades of marriage, I recently discovered that the two children I raised and supported are not biologically mine. While I was looking at Annie, we had a long conversation about our future. We were thinking about whether we should stay together or go our separate ways. But Dan, that incident happened more than 28 years ago. Can't we just forget about the past? But I can't forget about it. You had an affair, and I deserve to know the truth about the children I've been taking care of all these years. According to the results of the tests, it was confirmed that Janice and Brad are siblings, which indicates a long-standing love relationship and not a one-time case. The exposure raises questions about who else was involved. Apparently, the affair took place at the very beginning of the marriage, and Harvey was named the second participant. Despite the fact that the affair was a mistake, it has since stopped. The situation is complicated by the fact that Harvey died 25 years ago, and the question remains whether his wife Mary knew about the affair. Did she take part in your intimate life? Please, Dan, let's not talk about this. I love you. It's all in the past. Can't we just move forward? Are you serious? What's going on with you? We got married, and soon after that, you started a relationship with Harvey. You had his child, whom I raised as my own, and two years later, when we were still connected with him, we had another daughter, whom I also raised as my own. If he hadn't passed away shortly after Janice was born, you might still be with him. I am grateful that at least one of my children is really mine. Are you ready to clarify everything? Annie burst into tears. But I couldn't be persuaded. I needed to know the truth. I had the right to do that. Unlike the fictional scenarios in the movies, I could face reality. I know that you and Harvey were old friends. I had feelings for him, but in the end, he chose Mary over me, and they had a child together. I had feelings for you, too but not as deep as I had for Harvey. After their wedding, I fell into a deep depression. You proposed to me, and I accepted it partly out of anger at Harvey. I wanted him to see that I was moving on without him. So you married me to get back at Harvey and ended up sleeping with him behind my back? I asked. You often left in a tow truck. Mary worked during the day and Harvey came to me. It wasn't a deliberate decision. It just happened that way. I can't make excuses for my actions. We had a bedtime relationship, and I realized that I still have feelings for him. He visited me, promising that one day we would be together, but there was no hurry. I was young, and as long as he showed me love, I was happy. But he disappeared when I got pregnant with Brad, and I felt angry and abandoned. When he finally returned and saw Brad, he asked if it was his child. I refused to answer until he married me, but he laughed and offered to raise his child alone. Did he really think I was gullible enough to believe in a coincidence? What exactly happened? If you're trying to convince me that it just happened like that, 
Then you must be dumber than I thought. What happens to Janice if you stop seeing her? Did the same thing happen to her? I made it clear to him that he is not welcome in our house if neither you nor Mary are there. I had feelings for him, but I soon discovered that he was only using me for physical intimacy. One day he came and forced himself on me. He threatened to reveal Brad's secret if I resisted. He didn't show me any tenderness. He hurt me. He caused me deep pain. As he left, he grinned and expressed a desire to impregnate me again. I kept this information to myself, afraid that it would jeopardize our relationship. Shortly after Janice was born, Harvey tragically died in a car accident. I was devastated, but at the same time I felt a sense of relief. I was finally able to put the pain of his infidelity behind me and move on. My love for you grew stronger every day. Our life together was fulfilling, wasn't it? I've spent years trying to fix my mistakes. Despite our differences, I think we had a happy marriage, didn't we? Was our marriage really good? Looking back, I realized that it was built on deception. You were unfaithful by marrying me when you were still in love with another man. You gave birth to another man's child, claimed you were forced to, and got pregnant again without informing me. And now you expect me to be able to just move on. I can't, and I don't want to. I am contacting our lawyer to start the divorce process. Annie begged. You can't do this, but what about our children? How do you explain this to them? I don't believe you were forced to sleep with him, and you would have continued to make love to him if he hadn't died. You have a week to share your story with the kids. After that, I'll tell them the truth. Brad and Janice don't know that I'm not their biological father. Only you and I know this secret. Please, Dan. They love you. Don't hurt them by telling them that a stranger is their real father. I am their father, and they are my children. You can't do without it. I've been on their side from the very beginning, and that's not going to change. I think we'll stay in this house until everything is sorted out, unless you have someone else in mind. Dan, you know this is inappropriate. The thing is, after 30 years of living together, I still feel like I don't really know you. I'll move my things to the guest room. I can't keep living like this with you. Annie started crying when I got up from the table and started moving my things into the guest room. Two days later, I got a call from the store and was informed that my wife's car flew over the fence and fell onto the embankment. In their opinion, she exceeded the speed limit and did not manage to turn in time. Unfortunately, she was pronounced dead at the scene. The sheriff asked me if my wife had any problems, to which I replied that as far as I know, she had not. He said he would classify it as an accident, but would wait for the autopsy report before making final conclusions. I never imagined that now I would have to face all these unpleasant details. Despite loving her, I hated her, if such conflicting emotions are even possible. I gathered all the children and told them the news of my mother's death, saying that I would go to the hospital to identify her body. I instructed them to contact several relatives to share this heartbreaking news. The shock of her death was hard for everyone, including me, because now I was carrying the burden of her death. The question of whether she had committed stupidity or whether it was a tragic accident remained open. A few days later, the autopsy results showed that there was nothing untoward in her life, and the only anomaly was the presence of blood pressure medications in her body. The investigator did not find any other causes of her sudden death. After it was determined that her death was accidental, I mourned her at the funeral. Despite the divorce, I still had deep feelings for her after three decades of living together. I was relieved that I hadn't gone to a lawyer yet, because no one needed to know about Annie's secret affair. It was something I had to carry alone because sharing it with the kids didn't make sense. The day after the funeral... My two daughters and my daughter-in-law arrived at the house, and I asked them to collect all my mother's personal belongings. I only asked for a few family photos. It's hard to understand my pain unless you've experienced something similar yourself. The what-if questions were eating me up. What if I hadn't passed the test? What if I don't tell Annie? What if I hadn't left her? Would things have turned out differently? 
Or was fate just moving too fast that day? Two years ago, right before the holidays, everything changed. I found myself alone on vacation again, as my son and eldest daughter now lived far away from me. I offered to visit them for a day or two during the holidays, but my daughter Mandy had other plans. As a college graduate, she got the opportunity to go to England with friends on vacation, thanks to a trip organized by her school. A few months before, she had mentioned this trip to me, expressing concern that I would be alone. I assured her that I had been living alone for two years. Every day I found myself in the store at the service station, never being alone in this noisy environment. One day, I settled into a cozy armchair and turned on some programs on my outdated TV. A familiar advertisement appeared on the screen, urging viewers to donate $24 a month to provide a child in a third world country with three meals a day, housing, medical care, and education. I couldn't help but doubt the justice of such a call. Although I fully support the idea of helping the less fortunate, I couldn't help but wonder if such advertising really makes a difference. For a dollar a month, I would move there myself. Unfortunately, I am not enthusiastic about sending money with the hope that it will benefit the children. I wish success and blessings to those who participate in such events. But this situation gave me an idea. The next day, while at the store, I met one of the local priests and asked how the church's Christmas campaign was going. I asked if they were organizing a program where families in need could be identified by writing their names on a tree. The priest confirmed that such an action was indeed taking place. Do you have a last name that you would like to share for publication? No, I would like to help one family during the holidays, I replied. That's great, Dan. Just come to the church and choose a name from the Christmas tree. It's pretty full this year. Many people are in need because of unemployment. Jim, can you recommend a family that really needs help? I want to make a significant impact on the holiday and not just help a family experiencing difficulties due to a recent layoff, Dan asked. I'm not just handing a toy to a child. I want him to remember this holiday forever, I said with a smile. Jim seemed to understand my desire to have a positive impact on the family's life. Dan, I think I've found the perfect family for you. A young widow with three children recently moved here from the city. Her husband tragically died as a result of a crime related to the use of illegal substances, and she moved here in the hope of giving her children the opportunity to start a new life, explained Pastor Jim. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate the opportunity to help, I replied gratefully. Although I am not a regular visitor to the church, this year I feel obligated to extend a helping hand to those who need it. I plan to come back later to find out the name of the family in need. When I told Pastor Jim about my reluctance to attend church, he was sympathetic. Although I am not religious, I believe in higher powers. I used to attend church only twice a year, usually on special occasions, weddings, and funerals. But I still remember the sermons about the birth and crucifixion of Jesus. Recently, I came across a piece of paper with Carmela Wilson's name on it, which I took down from a tree in the church. Pastor Jim informed me about a widow with three children, as well as her address and phone number. He mentioned that she works as a waitress at Joe's restaurant, where I often go. I was sure he was referring to Carmela, a familiar face that I had seen her wait tables countless times. Taking a hands-on approach to business management, I decided to drop by the restaurant to make sure everything was going smoothly. When I entered Joe's diner, I noticed the owner, who waved at me affably. We had been friends since childhood and both owned businesses, which brought us even closer together. Sitting at a table, I observed the quiet atmosphere in the middle of the morning, between breakfast and lunch. Carmel caught my eye and greeted me with a smile, promising to join me soon. If you describe Carmela, she was about 30, had a pleasant appearance, and, although she was not an ordinary beauty, radiated a neat and attractive charm thanks to her shoulder-length dark hair. She had attractive legs and a medium bust, although slightly protruding. She wasn't thin, but she wasn't overweight either. Describing the woman's face turned out to be more difficult than expected, but her smile was undeniably pleasant. What can I offer you? She asked. 
Just a cup of coffee and a little conversation, if you don't mind, I replied. Coffee, yes, but I'm not sure about the conversation, she replied. I apologize for not being able to communicate with women. I assure you this is not a flirtation. I just chose your name on the Christmas tree in the church because I would like to be your friend during the holiday season. I'm not sure about your intentions, so I'm just going to have coffee with you. I watched her approach Joe, and he nodded disapprovingly when she returned with my coffee. Joe says you're good, she said. I am often approached by men, but now I am not interested in it. So what exactly do you mean by saying that you want to be a friend on holidays? I'm grateful to the church that my children's names are on the Christmas tree for gifts, but I noticed that they didn't say anything about me having a friend. I have an idea, friend, and I want to share it with you. If you want, I can buy gifts for the children myself. In short, I saw a program on TV that talked about sponsoring a child in need in another country for only $24 a month. This sponsorship will provide the child with food, clothing, education, and housing. I was amazed that all this could be obtained for only $24 a month. Dan, right? She asked. My children consume $24 worth of milk every month. I can barely afford more than that, she said, smiling. Her smile was truly beautiful. I understand everything, I replied. That's why I decided to adopt a family this year, starting with yours. I want to help you with your financial needs ahead of Thanksgiving and Christmas. I want your family to have a special holiday season. I may not be rich, but I can allocate enough funds to help one family, and I chose yours. Are you serious? I was so worried about my children this year. You know, my husband... I know, Carmel, he's dead. Let me help you help your children. If you feel like I'm interfering in your life, just tell me and I'll leave. Why are you doing this? Don't you have a family to help? Not an unknown stranger? Well, my wife died two years ago. She died in a car accident. Oh, I'm so sorry for you. It's okay, Carmel. I didn't spend my holiday season in the best way, and this year I wanted to make someone else happy. I have three adult children, my son is already over 30, and my daughter is about 29. They are both married and have their own families. The youngest daughter recently graduated from college and is going to England for Christmas. None of them are experiencing financial difficulties. So would you like to make friends for the holidays? You seem like a kind person, Dan. For the sake of my children, I will agree. But please, no tricks. Over the past year, my family and I have faced a lot of problems. How can I help you? It would be nice to start by replenishing your coffee supply and identifying all your needs. While she was filling my cup, she mentioned that she had to go back to work. She was friendly, but she had things to do. We agreed to meet the next day when she finishes her shift. I offered to go out for dinner, but she expressed a desire to stay at home with the children. Nevertheless, she invited me to her house for a chat and even offered to share a macaroni and cheese dinner with them. How do you like this option, Dan? I'll buy a pizza and we can eat. Pepperoni and cheese, does that sound good? She grinned. It sounds great but maybe you should get two pizzas. My eight-year-old child can eat half of one by himself. In the evening, I went to her house and was surprised to find that she lives in the project. For those who do not know, this is housing provided to those in need by social services or child support services. Although these organizations offer assistance with rent, meals, and other necessities, living conditions may not be ideal. The area was known for being home to drug addicts and other people who were considered undesirable. Despite this, my determination to help Carmel and her children remained firm. When I arrived at her house, I was greeted by her eight-year-old son, a charming and friendly boy. When he asked why I was here, I explained that I was a pizza delivery guy and that his mom had invited me to visit. His face lit up with joy as he exclaimed, Mom said her friend is bringing us pizza today. We rarely buy pizza at the store. When I entered the house, Two other children excitedly ran up to me, shouting about the arrival of pizza. A six-year-old child exclaimed, Pizza, 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 mommy, the pizzeria has arrived. Carmel came out of the next room, clearly in no hurry to tidy herself up. Children, where are your manners? 
she scolded. I thought I taught you how to behave when we have guests. I'm sorry, Mom. We were just too excited, her eldest son replied, looking at me. We don't have visitors that often. Can we have pizza now? Kids, this is Dan, my friend, Carmel introduced. I interrupted Carmel. You can call me Uncle Dan or Mr. Dan, or just call me Dan. What's your name? The eldest spoke first, introducing himself as Mike, eight years old. Then the second, Mark, age six, added, This is my little sister, Molly, he said. Molly replied confidently, I know who I am. My name is Molly, and I'm four years old. I'm going to be five soon. I go to kindergarten, and I'm very smart. The little girl was incredibly kind and strikingly similar to her mother. When everyone gathered at the table to enjoy pizza, I couldn't help but notice the shabby furniture and the lack of things in the room. It was obvious that this family was experiencing financial difficulties. I only managed to catch a glimpse of their kitchen and living room, but it was enough to get an idea of their situation. Despite the outdated TV and poor image quality, the children enjoyed eating pizza and watching cartoons. When I offered to help, Carmel politely declined, insisting that she and her children were doing a great job with everything. This moment took me by surprise. I realized that this family, experiencing difficulties, intends to make the most of their circumstances. Although we eat well, my children are often jealous of what other children have, and I can't afford to buy it for them. Our TV has poor image quality, but I bought a basic cable channel so they would have something to watch. We buy used clothes, but my children are grateful for everything they get. They are wonderful children, but I hesitate to buy bicycles or any outdoor equipment because I am afraid that they will be stolen. Dan, please think about it. Any gift will be highly appreciated by my children. I will do my best to help them in any way I can. Your children are behaving well. Mike, as the oldest, do you think you'd like to go to the new Harry Potter movie on Saturday? That would be great. Mom, can we go, please? I think so, but only if you all behave yourself by the end of the week. Carmel, this also concerns you. Maybe we can grab a bite at McDonald's while we're out. Molly smiled and said, I love McDonald's. Do they really have happy dinners and a playground? Okay, Molly. If you behave yourself for mom's sake, we can go there on Saturday, Carmela said with a smile. The children were delighted, and Carmela was beaming. I was proud of myself for bringing them joy, which in turn brought happiness to me. On weekends, we began to regularly take the children to places where they could just have fun. During lunch at Joe's restaurant, I always sat in the Carmel section and began to leave generous tips, about $10 each time. Dan... You really shouldn't do this. All I want is for my children to be happy. That's all that matters to me. Are you sure you don't need the money? I chuckled. This is wrong, Dan. I mean, I'm definitely going to need the money. Simply, I feel a little guilty, to be honest. It seems to me that I am indebted to you for all the help you have given my children. Maybe I could cook you a Thanksgiving dinner or something? I want to do something for you, too. I'll talk to the kids now. Find out what our plans are, and I'll call you back. Carmel, I like doing this for you because it brings me joy. I find satisfaction in helping those who seek to improve their situation. Please don't feel obligated to repay me in any way. Seeing happiness on the faces of children is a sufficient reward for me. Besides, it gives me great pleasure to see your smile. I noticed that she felt a little uncomfortable, and she quickly looked away. When Mandy came home for the weekend, she asked if there was any news. I shared with her my attempts to help Carmel. Dad, do you think this is a wise decision? After all, you don't know this woman, do you? Dear, the support of other people and the joy on the faces of these children helped me find a new sense of purpose. I really feel satisfied with the work I'm doing. I was talking to Carmel recently and I'd like you to meet with her and share your thoughts. I understand your concerns, Dad. Carmel and her children really live in a difficult area. That's why I want to help them. To help them overcome difficulties and rebuild their lives. Mandy, you will always be my precious daughter. You've turned into an amazing woman, and you don't seem to need my help so much anymore. 
I feel like I have to help someone else. How about inviting Carmel over so you can meet her and the kids and then share your thoughts with me? Sure, Dad. But I can't promise anything. I will be completely honest with you, without embellishment. Mandy looked a little worried. She was my rock and always had my back. I think she would have told me the truth. She was like me in many ways, and it was not in her nature to cheat. Last Saturday, I invited Carmel and the kids to my house. Despite the cool weather, I still decided to cook a grill outside. While I was cooking, I asked Mandy to do the grilling inside. Carmel arrived in her battered car, and all the children were securely strapped in. When she started to unfasten her seatbelts, Mandy looked at me and said, Nice car, Daddy, meaning the opposite. I grinned and replied, What makes you think I'm helping them? What would you say if she drove up in a new car? Dad, this is an amazing idea, she said with a smile. Mike and Mark came up to me excitedly. Hello, Uncle Dan. Do you really live in this huge house? I introduced the boys to Mandy while Carmel helped Molly out of the car. Nice to meet you, boys, Mandy greeted them. My name is Mike, I'm eight, and this is Mark, he's six, and this baby is Molly, our little sister, Mike explained as Molly got out of the car. Four-year-old Molly came up to me and I picked her up in my arms. Mandy was watching us closely. Molly is like a little companion to me, I said. She, like you, can stand up for her brothers. I grinned. Carmel, this is Mandy, my youngest daughter, who brings me great pride and joy. As they exchanged greetings, I could almost see their thoughts working. Finally, Carmel smiled at Mandy and said, I realize this is a little unusual. I understand that you have a lot of questions about me and my purpose here. I've been thinking about the same questions myself. Let's put them aside for now and just enjoy this day together. I will try to answer some of them. Your father, in my opinion, is a very kind man. Take me to the kitchen so we can cook together. Some men think that grilling is a complete meal because they cook meat, but we women know better. Mandy looked at me warmly. I like her already, Daddy. They exchanged smiles, after which we all headed into the house. The children were eager to explore the house, and I allowed them to do so but on condition that they stay away from the boxes and don't run around the streets. They enthusiastically went from room to room, and then returned, and told their mother about their discoveries. When they asked to watch my big screen TV, I suggested that everyone go to the store together and choose some DVDs to watch. They readily agreed, with Molly asking if she could join them. Carmel intervened, suggesting that Molly stay to help her and Mandy cook, stating that the girls needed to stick together. Molly seemed to tell me what to do because she turned to me and said, Uncle Dan, why don't you take the boys and go ahead? I need to help the girls cook. It was quite funny on the part of a four-year-old child. I assured her that everything was fine and promised to rent a movie especially for her. As a result, I took The Little Mermaid for her, and she did not stop smiling during the viewing. She even invited Mandy and her mom to join her, she allowed the boys to watch too, but only so that they wouldn't make any noise. It was funny watching her try to act like an adult. A group of girls decided that Thanksgiving would be celebrated at our house. Carmel and Mandy volunteered to cook, and I entertained the kids, which was very simple. Although my pool was closed for the winter, we had a jacuzzi, which the children planned to enjoy in bathing suits. After bathing, they sat down to watch movies on the big TV. When we had enough time to prepare, Mandy suggested that we contact Brad and Janice and let them know about our Thanksgiving plans. Four-year-old Molly came up to me, and I picked her up in my arms. Mandy was watching us closely. Molly is like a little companion to me, I said. She, like you, can stand up for her brothers, I grinned. Carmel, this is Mandy, my youngest daughter, who brings me great pride and joy. As they exchanged greetings, I could almost see their thoughts working. Finally, Carmel smiled at Mandy and said, I realize this is a little unusual. I understand that you have a lot of questions about me and my purpose here. I've been thinking about the same questions myself. Let's put them aside for now and just enjoy this day together. I will try to answer some of them. 
Your father, in my opinion, is a very kind man. Take me to the kitchen so we can cook together. Some men think that grilling is a complete meal because they cook meat, but we women know better. Mandy looked at me warmly. I like her already, Daddy. They exchanged smiles, after which we all headed into the house. The children were eager to explore the house, and I allowed them to do so, but on condition that they stay away from the boxes and don't run around the streets. They enthusiastically went from room to room and then returned and told their mother about their discoveries. When they asked to watch my big screen TV, I suggested that everyone go to the store together and choose some DVDs to watch. They readily agreed, with Molly asking if she could join them. Carmel intervened, suggesting that Molly stay to help her and Mandy cook, stating that the girls needed to stick together. Molly seemed to tell me what to do, because she turned to me and said, Uncle Dan, why don't you take the boys and go ahead? I need to help the girls cook. It was quite funny on the part of a four-year-old child. I assured her that everything was fine and promised to rent a movie especially for her. As a result, I took The Little Mermaid for her, and she did not stop smiling during the viewing. She even invited Mandy and her mom to join her. She allowed the boys to watch too, but only so that they wouldn't make any noise. It was funny watching her try to act like an adult. A group of girls decided that Thanksgiving would be celebrated at our house. Carmel and Mandy volunteered to cook, and I entertained the kids, which was very simple. Although my pool was closed for the winter, we had a jacuzzi, which the children planned to enjoy in bathing suits. After bathing, they sat down to watch movies on the big TV. When we had enough time to prepare, Mandy suggested that we contact Brad and Janice and let them know about our Thanksgiving plans. After Carmel and the kids left, I had a nice chat with Mandy. She mentioned Carmel and the children, emphasizing Carmel's kindness and work ethic. Mandy also informed me that anyone who wants to use the jacuzzi should remember to bring their bathing suits. Carmel shared with me the tragic story of her husband's murder, detailing the difficulties she had to go through. Now I understand why you are eager to help her, especially given her dedication to children. She is not making excuses for her life, and it is obvious that she is making sincere efforts to save the situation. Dad, I believe she really cares about you. And why not? I support her and her family. I hope she appreciates me a little bit. No, Dad. I mean caring in a deeper sense, maybe even love. Maybe she didn't say it, but we women can feel things like that. Dad, I think you fell in love with her too. Please, Mandy, I'm very happy for her. This is the most joyful thing I've seen you do since our mother died more than two years ago, Dad. My heart rejoices when I see you happy. I just urge you to remember your circumstances. Mandy correctly noted that I have deep feelings for Carmel and the children. Although I do not know what these feelings can lead to, I admit their presence. I was surprised to find out that others noticed it too. Besides, Brad and Janice called me separately. I tried to tell him that I had helped Carmel during the holidays and that I had learned the family's last name from the Christmas tree in the church. It seemed to me that I had successfully completed the story. I informed them that Carmel wanted to express his gratitude by helping with Thanksgiving dinner. Although they were hesitant at first, they eventually agreed to join us for dinner. In the weeks that followed, Carmel and Mandy worked together to coordinate all the preparations. Their relationship resembled that of sisters. Carmel took over the role of senior and led most of the planning. Of course, Mandy went to school most of the week and returned home on Fridays. I visited them almost every day to have lunch at the restaurant and mostly to see Carmel. At least twice a week I went to her apartment to say hello to the children and bring them treats. Carmel told me that I spoil them. I have to say that it bothered me a little when I watched Carmel work. She was always so friendly and nice to everyone. I've seen men molest her, but she always smiled and refused to be courted or dated. I think it was natural for me. I had no right to be jealous of her even dating, let alone being friendly with other people. On Thanksgiving Day, Carmel and her children arrived at our house early in the morning. In a simple skirt and blouse, 
Carmel looked amazing, effortlessly. When she and Mandy started cooking, Mandy mentioned that she had also invited her boyfriend to join us for dinner. I've already met him several times. He worked as a paramedic and also went to college where he crossed paths with Mandy, who was studying to be a nurse. They were both part of a team traveling to England to help at the hospital during the holidays. Their departure was scheduled for the week before Christmas and their return on the 8th of January next year. There was less than a month left and the thought of Mandy not being around at that time was haunting. Brad, his wife Gail, and my two grandchildren arrived. I hugged them all, and the children eagerly asked when they could use the jacuzzi. I said that I would like to introduce them to other children later. Then I introduced them to Mike, Mark, and Molly, who seemed to like each other right away. When we went into the kitchen, Mandy hugged her brother warmly and began to introduce him to Carmel. Brad, Gail, this is Carmel, she said, feeling proud to introduce her as her father's close friend. Brad just greeted Carmel, but I could see that he was already looking at her. Gail, on the other hand, warmly welcomed Carmel and offered the girls help with everything they needed. Janice and her husband Rob arrived, and we all started chatting. Janice's children happily ran to the basement to play with other children, where we had a lot of games, coloring books, and various entertainments. The basement has been recently renovated and is equipped with a TV and DVD player so that the children do not get bored. Meanwhile, the women returned to the kitchen to continue cooking, and we guys tried not to disturb them. I felt that men were interested in learning about Carmel and her story, so I tried to explain without giving away my true emotions. But I realized that I'm not very good at hiding my feelings. Wow, she looks great, Dad, Brad commented. Is she about my age? She's actually 31 years old, Brad, Rob replied. She's really an amazing woman and she could use some help. Dad, he always called me Dad, Rob added. Aren't you afraid that she might have feelings for you or vice versa? Well, I'm a widower and she's a widow, I explained. She may be younger, but if something happens, then so be it. Dad, were you together? Brad asked. I'm sorry, Brad, but this conversation seems inappropriate and too personal to me. As your parent, I think it's important to be honest with you. I want to make it clear that I did not try to kiss her, and I want you to know that she is a wonderful woman who is very dear to me. I understand that it may be unpleasant for you to talk about this topic, and I apologize. I know you must miss your mother, because it's been two years since she passed away but my feelings for this woman have nothing to do with your mother. I'm a living person, and if I find someone attractive, then that's my own business. Let's change the subject and continue the conversation. Let's go check on all the kids. Your wives are cooking, so we'll have to babysit. We went downstairs to look after the children. The Carmel children got along well with each other. Molly kept coming up to me to chat, which bothered Brad but Rob found her the sweetest girl. Mandy brought her boyfriend Ross downstairs to introduce him to everyone. I've already met Ross a few times, and I think Brad has too. After meeting Mandy, she returned upstairs, and Ross joined the conversation. I recently met Mandy's friend, Carmel, and found that she is a very kind woman. Mandy mentioned that her husband was tragically murdered, and it's very unfortunate. I decided to get to know Carmel's children better, and they seemed like good guys to me, despite the loss of their father. Ross praised me for helping the family, and I thanked him for his kind words. It was lucky that I chose a family in need from the church's donation tree. I wanted to keep my request to Pastor Jim to find a certain family a secret. So Ross, what's new in your life? I guess school and work are both bothering you. Yes, that's right, but in a couple of weeks we have a trip to work. I'm looking forward to going somewhere and spending time with Mandy. How are you and Mandy doing? Brad asked. Ross glanced at me and then turned back to Brad. I love her and I'm thinking of proposing to her when we're in England, before Big Ben. While Ross and I were talking, a large clock loomed in the background. Are you letting me propose to her? Ross asked nervously. I reassured him, you don't need my permission. Mandy is a strong and independent woman who can make her own decisions, 
But if you need my blessing, then you have it. Ross hesitated. Is this a guarantee? Should I ask her? I advised him to wait and find out if she was ready for marriage before asking a question. Ross nodded. I love her, but I want to get a definite yes before asking. We promise to keep your secret, Ross, and we wish you all the best. I sympathized with him because I shared the same feelings, but decided it was better to keep quiet for now. The rest of the day passed without incident. An amazing dinner was prepared, and everyone had a great time. The children took turns having fun in the jacuzzi, while the adults preferred to stay away. Carmel mentioned that she would go there another time, and I made a mental note to remind her of that. As the evening went on, Mandy and Ross left to be together. I helped Carmel clean the house, and then Dennis and Gail joined us. When we finished, Brad and his family were preparing to leave. Brad expressed his pleasure at meeting Carmel and wished her luck, hoping that everything would turn out well. Before leaving, Janice pulled me aside and expressed her concern, saying that Carmel was a good woman, but too young for me. I was taken aback by her remark, because I had just given her a helping hand. Janice insisted that Carmel had feelings for me that I didn't know about. We asked about her status and she told us that she has a relationship with a guy. That guy turned out to be you, Dad. Otherwise, she wouldn't have come to us today. Be careful, Dad. When everyone left, Carmel gathered the children and said that she really enjoyed living with us. She found my family pleasant and kind. For some reason, I bent down and kissed her. The kiss was gentle and long. When we parted, there were tears in her eyes. You shouldn't have done that, Dan. I have to leave. After picking up the children, they quickly said goodbye to me and jumped into the car. When I approached Carmel at the car window, I apologized, admitting that I had crossed the line and asked for forgiveness. To tell you the truth, Dan, I've been hoping for this for a long time, she confessed, and drove home in her old car. As the weekend passed and I didn't hear from her, I became more and more worried about my actions. On Monday, I went into the restaurant and found that she was not there. Joe informed me that she needed to take Molly to kindergarten and she would be back soon. I planned to return home at lunch by stopping by the store, but my plans were disrupted when one of my employees got sick and I had to take over. Realizing that I had gone too far, I tried to distance myself from Carmel. As her vacation buddy, not a romantic partner, I had to respect our friendship. When I got home, Carmel called me. When I saw her name on the caller ID, I hesitantly answered, but I heard from her, Dan, our apartment was broken into. When I returned home with the children, I found that our belongings had been stolen, including an old TV. We only have clothes left, she sobbed. Feeling lost, she called the police and wrote a statement. It was suspected that the thief was looking for things to sell them for illegal substances. Despite the fact that we had nothing of value, Everything we had was taken away. It hurt to hear her cry. I told Carmela to pack suitcases or bags of clothes for myself and the children, and I went to get them, promising to be there in 15 minutes. Don't worry, everything will be fine, I promise, he reassured Carmela. It's all right, Carmel. I'm glad you called me, I said, comforting her. Now go pack your things. I'll be there soon. I quickly got in the car and drove to Carmel's house to pick her up and the kids. Molly was crying and expressing her fear, but I assured her that everything would be fine. I promised to take them all to my house. Carmel looked at me in surprise. I thought you were just going to take us to a motel for the night, she said. No, everyone's coming home with me, I said. Put all the things you have collected in your car. Take my car and the kids. I'll take yours with your things. Without hesitation, she followed my instructions. I talked to the police officer and informed him that they could contact her at my house. I gave him my phone number for further communication. The officer noted that it was unlikely that they would be able to return any items to her, since she had not indicated anything of value that could be traced. The only thing the attackers did was severely damage the apartment. After expressing my gratitude to the officer, I climbed into Carmel's old car and tried to start it, but to no avail. With the help of an officer, 
I was able to start the car and drove home. When I got home, I found Carmel and the kids waiting for me on the porch. Confused as to why they hadn't entered the house, Carmel explained that they had been waiting for me to arrive before going inside. Having instructed the boys to help me unload my bags, Carmel told them to take their things to the bedroom with bunk beds. All of Molly's belongings were to be placed in the front bedroom, opposite Mandy's room. The boys' stuff is on the upper level, and the girls' stuff is on the lower level. If you are not sure, you can place them in the living room for Mom to decide for herself. Carmel, please come to me. Molly, could you help the boys and make sure they do everything right? Molly liked to lead the boys. Dan, what are you up to? We can't stay here. What will your children think? Carmel, you really need help today. Let's try to act my way for a few days so we can work out a plan. You and Molly can stay in the front bedroom and the boys can stay upstairs. Dan, the boys have a school and Molly has a kindergarten and I have a job. How will this affect life here? You'll just have to leave a little earlier. I can also help by taking Molly or the boys to school. Please call them tomorrow and tell them that your house has been robbed and that you will take the boys to school. Mention my name so that I can take care of taking them and picking them up. It's going to be okay, Carmel, I assure you. Dan, you are very dear to me. I have strong feelings for you. Your children know about it, and I want you to know too. Have you discussed this with them? I asked. No, women feel it without warning. But men may not understand. I can't speak for your son, Brad. But Mandy, Janice, and Gail know. I can't hide my feelings. They are always in plain sight. I will worry about my children, even though you have enough worries as it is. And anyway, I don't regret kissing you. I just wanted you to know. Upstairs, I checked how the boys were sleeping and made sure their drawers were empty. Carmel helped them choose their clothes. Meanwhile, Molly and I went downstairs to empty the drawers in their room. I was grateful that my late wife's things had been put away. The task was made easier by the fact that everyone came into the room with Molly and me. Molly asked her mother if she could keep her things in drawers. I took the boys and we went in search of dinner while Carmel put her things away. The boys and I cooked hot dogs and macaroni and cheese. As soon as everything was ready, we sat down at the table and started chatting over food. Carmel asked about the rules of conduct in the house, to which I replied that we would create them as we went along. We have informed the children that they need permission to do anything until the rules are set. They were informed that an invitation was required to enter my room or office. Access to the pool was strictly prohibited. Despite its closure, they were still children, and we emphasized the danger of drowning. Going to the jacuzzi required permission from mom or me, and it shouldn't have been a regular occurrence. Watching TV also required our permission. It was their job to keep their room tidy, although Carmel couldn't help but chuckle at the memory of the boys' not-too-tidy habits. At least the rules were set. I looked at the boys and Molly, who was always smiling at me. Children, this is your new home. Feel free to be kids and have fun, but always remember to ask your mom's permission if you're not sure about something, I reminded them. But Uncle Dan, what if we get hungry? Mike asked. Just eat. That's what I do when I'm hungry. Tomorrow, my mom and I will buy you snacks. You will always have food. Just remember that your mom is in charge when it comes to food. And one more thing, and I want to make it clear. If your mom says no, please don't ask my permission. If I say no, don't try to embarrass mom. No means no. Any more questions? Molly raised her hand, and the gesture made me smile because I assumed she had learned it in kindergarten. Yes, Molly? Can we play with toys in the basement, even if they don't belong to us? Of course you can play with any toys that we have downstairs, I replied. I told Molly that this year we will talk to Santa, and he will probably bring you gifts, I informed her. Molly raised her hand impatiently and asked, Can I go play with them? Of course, honey, go. I'll join you downstairs soon, Carmel replied. Molly got up quickly and headed down the stairs, followed by the boys. As they were walking down the stairs, one of the boys called out, Uncle Dan, can we watch TV? 
I just shouted back. Carmel came up to me and hugged me tenderly, tears glistening in her eyes. She whispered, I don't know how I would have coped without you. Wiping away her tears, she pulled away and we didn't hug anymore. I realized that I needed to say something comforting, but not too serious or joking. Taking her hands in mine, I assured her, I will always be by your side. Changing the subject, I suggested, let's go see how the kids are doing. We went down to the basement to join the children, creating a sense of family. Memories of how Annie and I sat together and watched the children play came back to me. It was the right place. When it got late, Carmel told the children to take a bath and get ready for bed. Since the spacious house had three bathrooms, she directed the boys to the bathroom upstairs, and Molly was allowed to use the main bathroom on the ground floor. Carmel, this is your home now. Molly, of course, can use the large bathroom and shower, I assured her. If necessary, I'll use the shower in the basement. Please feel free to make yourself at home, I told Carmel while she was getting the kids ready for bed. While she was busy, I went to my office to work on my books for a while. Looking up, I noticed that Molly was looking at me from the doorway in a small nightgown, obviously just out of the shower. Hello, Molly. Do you need anything? I asked. She replied, I want to kiss you goodnight, but Mom said I can't enter your office until you let me. I smiled and invited her in, saying, Come in, honey. When she burst in, I had to lean back in my chair to make room for her on my lap. She hugged me tightly and kissed me on the cheek, after which she wished me goodnight. Goodnight, Uncle Dan, she whispered. Where's Mom? I asked. She's upstairs arguing with Mikey and Marky, Molly replied. Well, let's go see if we can help. Without thinking, Molly ran up the stairs, and I followed her. We caught them in the middle of a discussion. But Mom, Mikey protested, Mike is constantly getting his way because of his age. When I asked for the top bunk, he simply stated that he was older and therefore had to choose first. Carmel, Mike, Molly, and I were there, and I watched in silence. I asked Mike if he really thinks he should always be first because of his age. Mike replied that he was older and therefore deserved such treatment. I noted that he was only two years older than his brother and suggested that this should make him two years wiser. Is it really necessary to argue about who gets which bed? Let's come up with a plan to share the top bunk, Mike suggested to his younger brother. How about you take the top bunk this month and we'll switch next month? We can alternate like this. Mark agreed with a smile and climbing into the upper bunk, thanked Mike for being a great big brother. You feel good inside, don't you, Mike? His mom asked. Yes, probably mom, Mark replied. After kissing her son's goodnight, Carmel took Molly downstairs to put her to bed. I have some work to finish, Carmel said, getting ready to take a shower and get ready for bed. Returning to my office, I heard the sound of a running shower. The image of Carmel in my soul did not leave my head for a long time. After the shower, Carmel appeared in a nightgown and bathrobe, with her hair still wet. Good night, Dan. Thank you for everything, she said, before heading to bed. After looking at her, I asked, Is there anything that doesn't suit you? Smiling, she walked over to the bed, the scent of the shower emanating from her. Taking a deep breath, I returned to work on the book. The morning flew by in a whirlwind of activity. She asked me to contact Joe and warn him that she might be late. She had to run errands at school and kindergarten, as well as change her address. When he dialed Joe's number, he doubted that I was serious about Carmel. He was determined to protect her from harm. A man in his sixties, married for more than four decades, seemed to take care of Carmel's interests. The fact that his wife worked as a chef in a restaurant testified to his sincere concern for Carmel's well-being. I assured him of my intentions to never harm Carmel and the children. Despite my desire to help them, my feelings for this family complicated the situation. In the evening, we returned to Carmel's old apartment to pack her things, which turned out to be few. After returning the keys to the office and making sure that the monthly rent was paid, 
She said that she had moved out because of the robbery of the apartment. Mike and Mark rode with me in the truck, and Carmel, Molly, and her old car followed. When we returned to the house, the phone rang. Carmel answered, and Mandy was on the other end of the line, asking why she was in the house. Carmel told me how her apartment was broken into, leaving her and the children almost homeless until I offered them a place to sleep. Mandy asked me to put her on the phone to talk to her. Dad, do you have any doubts about this? You know how she feels about you, right? What's the best thing to do, Mandy? Maybe I should just give her the money and tell her to figure it out on her own. I care about her, you know. We are both adults and have not committed any wrongdoing. I am sincerely glad that she and the children are here. It's like going back to the good old days. Dad, I just want to say that you're crossing a fine line. I sincerely consider Carmel a sister, and you know it. I'm just reminding you both to be careful and considerate of your actions. Can I talk to Carmel? After talking to Mandy for about 20 minutes, I helped the boys bring the remaining things into the house and put them away or put them in the basement. I asked, what did Mandy want to know after I returned your phone? She mentioned some concerns about us, mostly related to typical girly conversations. But really, what's there to worry about? We're both adults, damn it. I'm over 50 now and I've managed to get this far in life. I am confident in my ability to make decisions for a person who may not be able to make his own choice. Dan, it's important for you to know that I really care about you. I told Mandy about it and now you know it too. I explained to her that I wasn't sure what our relationship would lead to, but you were a great support for me and the kids. I will always be grateful to you for this, although my emotions sometimes cloud my gratitude. Mandy is worried that someone might get hurt in this situation. I assured her that I would never come between you and your family. Let's take matters into our own hands and continue to live in the present moment. Perhaps time will tell you the solution. At that moment, Mike and Mark entered the room. Uncle Dan, can we all go to the jacuzzi? They asked eagerly. I glanced at Carmel and then turned back to the children. Only if your mom joins you. I don't want you to go there alone, I replied firmly. Come on, mom. Please come with us, they begged. You'll like it. It's warm, relaxing, and full of bubbles. Please, mommy. They continued to beg. Yielding to their request, Carmel finally gave up and said, All right, boys, I'll join you. Go and put on your swimsuits. Molly, go get your swimsuit and I'll join you soon, I said when she looked at me accusingly. You planned this, didn't you? She asked, but I just smiled back. She went to change into a two-piece swimsuit and asked, Are you happy now? As she walked past me with a smile. Definitely. You look great in anything. I praised. I bet you even look good naked, I teased, to which she called me a pervert, but smiled anyway and headed to the jacuzzi. The children were looking forward to her arrival. Wow, she looks even more amazing, I mused as she settled into the tub. This woman really has everything. After a while, I handed Carmel her drink. She giggled and remarked, The water is just amazing. My body desperately needs it. The children sat quietly, mesmerized by the dancing bubbles. Thanks, Uncle Dan. This is amazing, Mike chimed in. I mean, it's warm, but not pleasant. Well, you know what I mean. After taking one last look at Carmel, I headed to the office to finish my paperwork. While I was working, I could hear everyone in the house bustling and getting ready for bed. Soon I saw Molly peeking into my office her smile lighting up her face as she waited for my permission to enter. It was impossible to resist her charm, as in the case of her mother. Molly came in, climbed onto my lap, kissed me, hugged me, and tenderly wished me a good night. See you in the morning, Uncle Dan. As already mentioned, I ran a hybrid gas station, a self-service store, and a grocery store. Although I was no longer doing car repairs, I had a tow truck in case of emergencies. Carmel came to me, upset that her car wouldn't start again. Annoyed by the constant problems with her car, I quickly sent a tow truck to pick her up from the diner. Upon arrival, I noticed two men who offered to help her with the battery and were clearly trying to flirt with her. 
Carmel later informed me that she had rejected their advances. I had to pick her up in the car. When the tow truck pulled up, the two guys who were with her retreated. Looking at Carmel, I thanked the guys for helping my fiancé, but assured them that I would do everything myself. This seemed to bother them, and they hurried away. I hooked Carmel's old car up to the tow truck, and she climbed in. Since the truck was elevated, I couldn't help but notice her long legs. Once inside the cabin, she slowly adjusted her dress. Thanks for coming, Dan, she said. I promised that I would always be there for you, and I'm doing it. When someone else offers to help you, I have conflicting feelings. On the one hand, I want others to see how wonderful you are, but on the other hand, it bothers me when people show interest in you. I didn't mean anything bad, Dan. I know, I just answered your question. Besides, I have no complaints against you. Do you remember how you introduced me to those guys as your bride? Why did you say that? Instead of answering, I just walked away and headed for the dump. What are we doing here, Dan? She asked, looking at the old car. I'll give you a couple hundred dollars for this pile of junk. You've already suffered enough with her. Take out your personal belongings and put everything in this garbage bag. We'll figure it out later. She shrugged her shoulders. We'll talk later, I replied. We need to hurry to get the kids in time. She quickly packed all her personal belongings into the truck, as well as the remaining shoes and children's toys. They signed a contract of sale and received $300 for the car. We took Molly's car seat and drove home. I opened the garage door and told Carmel she could drive my old car. She was only 8,000 miles away, and she was four years old. I bought it with the money I got from Annie's car insurance after the accident. Needless to say, her car was wrecked. I usually drove a truck, so the car was rarely used. The only time I rode it was when I took Carmel and the kids for a walk. She put Molly's car seat in the car and went to get the kids. When I returned, I informed the children that they had a new car that was significantly superior to their mother's old car. I urged Carmel to get behind the wheel, arguing that they needed something better, and this is a good car. I also offered to leave the car in my name and keep paying for insurance to save money. Carmel expressed concern about their relationship and asked what would happen if they broke up or if she left. I asked if she was going to move to another place. Oh no, I was just thinking about what I would do with the car if you decided to kick us out. Oh Dan, I didn't want you to think I was leaving. I'm sorry. It's unbelievable that our first fight was over this stupid car. Carmel, I swear that I will always provide you with a car. If you want, I can even put it in writing. I was just worried about your safety in that old car. I want you to be safe and stay by my side. I was shocked when she came up to me and kissed me. Molly didn't know if it was a sudden desire or something else, but the feeling was pleasant. She looked at her brothers and announced, Mom just kissed Uncle Dan. Carmel explained to the children that it was a thank you for letting them take my car. She clarified that the car now belongs to her, not Uncle Dan, since he gave it to her. Then Carmel surprised everyone by giving Uncle Dan another quick kiss. Okay, it's time to get ready for dinner, I announced. Are you cooking, or are we all going to McDonald's in Mom's new car? McDonald's was chosen by unanimous decision, and everyone shouted in agreement. On Friday, I ended up at the store while Carmel was busy with work. Suddenly, my children, Brad, Janice, and Mandy, came up to me. Daddy, we need to talk to you. Can we go to your house for a while? Their words were more of a demand than a request. Of course, go home. I'll be there soon. Just let me in, I replied calmly. I had a feeling that I knew what the conversation was going to be about, and I was ready for what was waiting for me. When I arrived home and entered the house, I found that my three children were gathered in the living room. It seemed that Brad would be the one to talk about Carmel and her children. Brad, it took you two hours to come here for this conversation. I can only imagine why, I said, feeling annoyed. What did Carmel do to make you dislike her so much? Brad quickly explained. It's not that I don't like her, Dad. It's just that one moment you're helping her, and the next, I noticed that your car wasn't there anymore, 
and I figured you'd given it to Carmel. As your children, I consider it my duty to explain to you what is bothering me. But first I have to express my disappointment in you. Dad, I think this woman is taking advantage of you because you're lonely. She knows your vulnerabilities and uses them to make you sympathize with her. Mandy stood up confidently, shaking her head at Brad's accusations. This is nonsense, nonsense. You may believe it, but I know Carmel better than you do. She would never betray her father like that. I really think she loves him, and the feeling is mutual. My main task is to support Dad and Carmel, not listen to your doubts, Brad. If you weren't my son, I would have knocked you off your chair. Let's talk about how Carmel got into the house. What do you think I should have done, Brad? Give her money? Or maybe I should just avoid her and make it clear that her problems are her own business? Brad, I followed my heart, not my physical desires, I explained. Daddy, are you saying that you've never made love to Carmel? No, Carmel and I didn't have intimacy, at least not yet. And anyway, it's none of your business what we do. But now I'm thinking about making an offer to Carmela. What? Brad exclaimed. Dad, you barely know this woman. She has a lot of luggage, plus three children. Dad, I have to be on Brad's side in this matter. Carmel is closer to my age. Isn't she too young for you? Janice doubted. Look, we're all on our own now. The three of you have practically grown up. I've found the woman I love. I have a spacious house that I am ready to share with a beautiful woman and her three children. Why are you so against it? I asked. Okay, Dad, imagine this scenario. You and this woman love each other and want to be together. She has three small children. Do you really want to start over and raise three more children? I love these kids. I like playing with boys the way we used to play, Brad. Molly hugs me and sits on my lap, just like my girls did when they were little. These are wonderful children, and I believe I can have a positive impact on their lives. Dad, you're too optimistic. These children are not yours. They are not your biological relatives. Can you imagine how you will take care of and raise these children for the next 20 years, even though they are not your flesh and blood? I'm sorry, Dad but I doubt you'd want to devote that much time to raising other people's children. Janice, what do you think about this? Should they also be considered my biological children? Dad, I'm not sure. I love you, and you will always be my father. Can you handle raising someone else's child? I'm not sure. Janice, let me put it another way. If I wasn't your father, you'd love me all your life. You've known this for as long as you can remember. Do you see me as your father or someone else in this role? This is a bit of a hypothetical question, but considering that you supported me financially and raised me like a native, I would consider you my real father. As for the upbringing of Carmel's children, this is a separate issue. I'll be right back. I want to share something important with you. I went back and collected all the DNA test results that were done for us. When I returned, I tried to explain some of this to the children. My mom and I kept some secrets from you, and we had no intention of revealing what I was going to show you. It might be a mistake to show you this now, but the situation with Carmel's children has become insurmountable. I cherish these children very much, and I think I could be a good father to them. I will show you the reasons for this decision right now. I handed each of them copies of their and my DNA results. Dad, what is this? Janice asked. These are the results of Brad and Yu's DNA test, I explained. It shows that you are both siblings, you have the same biological parents, and here are Mandy's results, with some differences in the marked blocks. This suggests that you and Brad most likely have only one parent in common. Upon hearing this, Mandy burst into tears. I'm sorry, Mandy, but here's my DNA. I am not the biological father of either Brad or Janice, I said firmly. There was stunned silence in the room as everyone took in the shocking revelation. Brad exclaimed in disbelief. It's impossible! You've always been my father! Janice sobbed. Is that why you asked me about my father, Dad? Now I know the truth. You are my father no matter what the tests say, she said defiantly. You will always be my father, and I love you very much, Dad. 
I came here today to express my concern about Carmel. I hope you didn't make a mistake. I feel confused and I want you to be happy. I thought I was taking care of you. While she continued to cry, I hugged her. Mandy joined us with tears in her eyes. Brad asked, Could you share with us the story of our biological father and tell us how long you've known about it? First of all, Brad, I want you and Janice to know that you are my children. Since I found out about it, nothing has changed except what you now know. You are my son, and Janice is my daughter. Family is not only about blood, it's about love and compassion. I was going to tell you about my father and how I found out about him. I married your mother at a young age, vying for her love with another man named Harvey Kittle. Harvey also loved another woman, Mary, and eventually married her when she became pregnant. I was grateful to your mother for staying with me and proposed to her, which led to our marriage and my subsequent happiness. A few years later, I found out from your mom that she was pregnant. Your mom got pregnant with you, Brad. Two years later, she became pregnant with Janice again. Unfortunately, Harvey passed away shortly after Janice was born, leaving your mother in a state of depression. After the DNA analysis, she confessed to me that you two were Harvey's children, and I was shocked and didn't know what to do. We decided to take a break for about a month to think about everything. Annie and I talked, and after that, your mom turned into the perfect wife a man could count on. She loved me, and I always took care of you as if you were my own children. This was the turning point. You all know what kind of life we led after that. We had a wonderful family until your mom had an accident. Dad, why did you agree to take the test and donate a kidney to me if you weren't my biological father? I prayed fervently to God, hoping that I would become a suitable donor for you, my son. If we were a match, I would gladly and without hesitation give you my kidney. Janice asked me if I had taken a match test before Brad went to the hospital. I admitted that I didn't do it because it was expensive and unnecessary at the time. When I passed the test, he confirmed that we were not suitable for each other. By the way, I have the test results for all our family members. Brad and Gail are the biological parents of their children, and Janice and Rob are the parents of their own children. To let you know there is no need to share the details of our conversation. Your mother was a loving wife and mother. Let's leave it as it is. I'm sorry, Dad. I'm ashamed of my actions. Upon hearing this, my son started crying. I haven't seen him this emotional since his mother's funeral. Brad, I understand that in times like these, people usually worry about their inheritance. It's not ideal, but that's the reality of life. I think you and Janice are probably more worried about your inheritance than about Carmela and my well-being. I realized this when I noticed that Brad and Janice were looking at the floor. Rest assured, all three of you will always be included in my will. I have made sure that each of you gets a fair share. I wanted to express my disappointment that you didn't show compassion to Carmel and her children, I told Janice, tears still streaming down her face. The possibility that she wasn't my daughter seemed to overshadow all thoughts of inheritance. Janice snuggled up to me, insisting that she didn't believe the test results and that I was her father and always would be. I hugged her tightly, comforting her as best I could. Just as I started hugging Mandy, Carmel's car pulled up. I won't tell Carmela unless you want to know why we're all here, I said. When Carmela entered the room, she greeted everyone in a friendly manner. What brings everyone here? She asked. After thinking about it, Mandy replied, Today is my last day off, so we all decided to go out for dinner. Carmen's face lit up with this idea. Oh, that would be great. Just give me a minute to change my clothes. Kids, why don't you chat with Mandy, Janice, and Brad while I get ready? She suggested. Molly walked over to Brad, who was already sitting down, and hugged him warmly. Hi, Brad, she greeted him. I like you, Brad said, looking at me. He seemed to understand what I was talking about. Mike walked up to Janice and asked, Did you bring your children so that we could all play together and practice sharing toys better? Janice replied, No, honey, they're home. Maybe you'll come to them after Christmas. Can I, Uncle Dan, please? Mike asked eagerly. I've never been to their house. We'll see, Mike, I replied. Christmas is still a couple of weeks away. 
I added. Mandy asked Mark about the latest developments. We recently bought a new car and Mom kissed Uncle Dan. All eyes were on me. Fortunately, Carmel showed up and saved the situation. Yes, Mike. I gave him two kisses as a thank you for letting us take the car. Actually, we're going to dinner now. Come on, kids, get in the car. Uncle Dan will be driving, so everyone should sit in the back. After dinner, Brad came over to us and we talked in private. I'm sorry, Dad. I'm sorry for my stupidity in doubting you. You were right when you asked how all this might affect you, Brad. It's just that the way you did it bothered me. I urge you not to doubt my actions if they bother you a lot. Let's talk like father and son until we reach an understanding. His smile reassured me when I mentioned our relationship as father and son. After that, I discussed it with Janice as well. I wanted my children to always feel my support. I'm still wondering if I did the right thing by telling them about it. But now, it's all settled. Janice asked me to babysit so she could go Christmas shopping with Carmel. I asked them to buy a few things for me as well, providing them with a list and enough money. I suggested that they leave things in storage so that I could pick them up later. I had the idea to buy bicycles for the children, because now they lived in an area where they could ride them. Pulling Carmel aside, I asked if she needed money for shopping. She replied that she was not shopping for herself, but for me and the children for Christmas. I got $300 when my friend sold my old car. I knew she was too proud to accept more money because she wanted to provide her children with good things without spoiling them. I asked Carmel if I could borrow her car to take the kids shopping, and she jokingly reminded me to be careful and not eat in it, as she had only recently received it. Smiling, I agreed. I took the kids to Santa's and took a picture with them, telling them that we were shopping for mom for Christmas. Mark told me that he would like to buy mom a nice present, but he doesn't have the money. I decided to give each of the children $20 for shopping on the condition that they can spend it only on mom, not on themselves. I told them to look for things that cost less than $20. When Mike asked if they could carry the money themselves, I agreed, but reminded them to keep it in their pockets so as not to lose it. Keep the money until you are ready to make a purchase. I handed out $20 bills to each of the boys, who quickly folded them and hid them. Molly, on the other hand, had a small purse full of various trinkets, so we made sure to find a safe place for her money. The children did not understand what money was and looked at expensive things with surprise. Realizing this, I decided to take them to a store designed for children. Inside, I led them through the aisles, showing them what they could afford with their money. I informed the cashier that if they want something extra, they should inform me about it. I was amazed by the dedication of these children who diligently searched for the perfect gift for their mom. The oldest, Mike, came up to me and asked me to borrow $5. Uncle Dan, mom loves unicorns, and one costs $25. Could you lend me the rest? Mike explained. I reminded him that the loan meant he would have to pay me back. Instead, I offered a deal. I would give him the difference if he washed my truck. Mike readily agreed and thanked me, after which he ran to buy a unicorn. Mark was engrossed in watching movies when I approached him and reminded him that he was supposed to be shopping for his mom. Yes, Uncle Dan, he replied. Mark explained that his mom loves movies like Titanic and Shrek because they make her laugh. He didn't know which movie to buy as he didn't have enough money for both. I calmed him down by giving him the extra money needed to buy both films. In return, I asked Mark to help Mike wash my truck. Mark gratefully accepted the money and promised that his mother would appreciate the films. I watched the woman who tried to help Molly, but she stubbornly shook her head. I asked Molly what was the matter if she couldn't find what she was looking for. She replied that none of the perfumes smelled like her mother, and she needed just such a one. I looked at the saleswoman and quietly mentioned the white diamonds. She tactfully informed me that the girl had only $20 and the perfume with white diamonds cost $50. I offered to tell her about the special offer for the bottle, at which it can be purchased for $20. Hello, Molly, the saleswoman greeted, holding out a bottle of perfume. Does this remind you of your mom? 
Molly sniffed and exclaimed, Yes, he smells just like her. Do I have enough money? The saleswoman calmed her down. You're lucky. This is our last bottle, and its price is $20. Molly grinned and reached into her purse for the money. With her purchase in hand, we went to visit Santa. I stood and held a bunch of presents while the kids chatted and posed for photos with Santa Claus. When they were done, I suggested that everyone choose a gift for Mandy, who was going to England. I've already paid for her trip as a Christmas present. The children readily agreed to help, and I took them to the luggage department and waited until one of the boys noticed the suitcases. Here they are, Uncle Dan, he exclaimed. Thanks, boys, I replied, pretending to be grateful for their help. I need a set of five items, I said. The boys quickly found a set of five pieces of luggage. I want to help Uncle Dan. What can I do? Molly asked eagerly. Honey, you can choose a color for Mandy. Choose a color that you think she'll like, I replied. Molly walked over to the set, which was bright pink in color. The boys informed her that there should be five parts in the set, but there were only three pink ones. After searching, Molly finally found a dark blue object. The boys said there were five parts in it and decided to buy it. Fortunately, there were only three pieces in the pink set. After stopping by the burger joint for lunch, they went home with their shopping. Upon entering the house, the children asked where they could hide their mother's gifts. They handed them to Molly, who offered to put them in the study. She told them to put Mandy's luggage on her bed so she could see it when she returned. They also chose a Christmas card for Mandy, and each of the children signed it with their own hands. Molly reminded them that the gift would be from all of them. When the girls returned, the boys told Mandy to go to her room. When she entered the room, she saw the luggage and a postcard from the children. They were all grinning mischievously at her. Mandy hugged and kissed each of them, expressing gratitude for the caring gift. The following weeks passed quickly as we juggled work and the children's school assignments. We bought a Christmas tree and decorated it with Christmas decorations. For the first time in three years, I had a Christmas tree. The holiday season was truly magical when children were around. After Mandy left for England, we planned to visit Janice and Brad on the 26th, the day after Christmas. Despite the hectic preparations for the holiday, the evenings were filled with joy. Every evening, the five of us gathered in the living room to watch Christmas shows together. That's how I wanted to spend this season. I went shopping and picked out some gifts for Carmel, and also gave her a gift certificate to the women's store so she could treat herself to something special. I visited a jewelry store and bought an engagement ring for her. Also, as a special gift, I bought an amazing red satin and lace nightgown. Christmas morning came, and the children were absolutely delighted. The boys eagerly ran downstairs, exclaiming that Santa had come to them and left many gifts under the tree. I told them to check their stockings, and I made coffee myself. Watching the joy and happiness on Carmel's face that morning, as well as seeing the three children, was a truly wonderful moment. Every time one of the children unwrapped a gift, Carmel was delighted. She got her favorite movies from Mark, a unicorn from Mike, and perfume from Molly. When Molly mentioned that the perfume was the last bottle and she just had enough money for it, Carmela looked at the $50 price tag, then at Molly, and smiled. Carmela also surprised me with some wonderful gifts. I didn't expect her to buy me anything, but everything she gave me was so caring and sweet. She mentioned that Mandy had informed her of my preferences and tried to buy what she thought I would like. There were three postcards on the Christmas tree, one for each of the children. I hid a bike for each of them somewhere in the house, and they were given clues to find them. The joy on their faces when they received their first bicycles was priceless. Molly already had a bike, so I bought wheels for her to make it more comfortable. I also bought wheels for Mark, even though I knew he wouldn't use them like his older brother. While the children were playing with their new toys, I gave Carmel a large box of nightgowns. Carmel admired, It's amazing. What motivated you to buy this? I handed her a small package. It's attached to it. When she opened it, tears welled up in her eyes. 
When I saw the ring inside, I got down on one knee and asked her to marry me. Overwhelmed with emotion, she hugged me tightly. Why, Dan? Why? She asked through her tears. Because I love you, and these two months have been the happiest of my life. I want you and the children to always be by my side. Dan, I know you're hoping for a yes answer, but the answer is no. Please give me a chance to explain before making assumptions. I really love you and I say this from the bottom of my heart. But so far the answer is no. It's not about your age, it's about us. We haven't been together that long and even though it's been an incredible few months, our relationship is just beginning. You made the decision to help a family in need by doing everything possible to support them. When the holiday season is over, life will return to normal for all participants. But I have a suggestion for you, which I hope you will consider. I want to rent our rooms, and I'm offering you $200 a week to cover the expenses. If you don't mind, we can offer a higher price. I want us to live together as a family, with the possibility to formalize this agreement within six months or even earlier. If you feel that something is not working out, just let me know and we can come up with something else. I want you to be confident in your decision. Getting used to the fact that a woman and three children live in your house takes time. I need support to be self-sufficient and productive. It is important that your family sees that I need more than just your money. I want you to understand that my love for you is sincere and not empty words. All I'm asking for is time, Dan. I'm here to stay until you tell me otherwise. She returned the ring to me and kissed me again. She asked me to leave her a nightgown, expressing the wish that none of us were in a hurry to get married. I clearly understood her message. Although we agreed not to rush into marriage, we wanted to be sure that this decision would be sincerely desired by both of us. I accepted her point of view, but at the same time I longed to deepen our intimacy both emotionally and physically. Despite the cool weather, our day was busy. The children were playing with toys. The lack of snow prompted the children to ask to ride bicycles. Carmel and I wrapped ourselves in our coats and watched them enjoy their new bikes. In the middle of the day, we got a call from England. It was Mandy. She called and informed us that Ross had proposed to her and she agreed. He did it against the backdrop of Big Ben and they planned to tie the knot next June. We expressed our joy to her and exchanged holiday wishes. Later, before putting the children to bed, the whole family watched a Christmas story. They came back to thank me for an amazing Christmas. Sitting on the bed, I listened to Carmel take a shower, anticipating the delicious scent that would soon fill the hallway. Lights came on in the bathroom and hallway, illuminating the dimly lit room with warm light. Carmel appeared in the doorway wearing a sexy new nightgown. Can I come in? She asked but I didn't say anything when she came in and closed the door behind her. Dan, I love you, she began, but I think we should hold off on getting married until we really understand each other. I want to start tonight. Will you make love to me? I was taken aback, but my smile gave me away. Carmel walked over to the bed where I pulled back the covers so she could slip inside and lie down next to me. The only light in the room was a reading lamp which I kept turned on to look at the woman who had occupied all my thoughts for the past two months. The night was unforgettable, but when I woke up in the morning, she was no longer with me. I tiptoed quietly into her room and found that she and Molly were sleeping peacefully. I went to the kitchen and started making coffee. After everyone got up, we had a hearty breakfast, and the next day we went to visit Janice and her family for a grand Christmas dinner. Brad and his family were also present at the meeting. We exchanged gifts, and I was pleasantly surprised to see that they had bought gifts for Carmel and the children. In turn, Carmela bought gifts for Brad and Janice's children. Mandy told Carmela that we usually only buy gifts for children, not adults. Brad explained that Gail had seen the sweater and thought it would look good on Carmela. The conversation turned to Christmas and the gifts that everyone was looking forward to. Janice then turned her attention to the upcoming wedding, which made Brad give me a curious look. I realized that he was interested to know if I had proposed to Carmel. 
Later he came up to me and apologized once again for his previous behavior. Dad, have you proposed to Carmel? He asked. Actually, yes, I replied. But she refused. What? I can't believe it. I thought she loved you, Dad. He exclaimed. What happened? I explained. She thinks it's too early for me to rush into marrying a woman with three children. She wants to make sure that I'm making the right decision. Moreover, she wants to contribute money to the household. She doesn't need handouts. She needs a loving relationship. That's what we're going to do. Give ourselves time. Wow, Dad, I've never met a woman like that. Dad, I know it sounds stupid after all I've said, but don't lose her. She's a special woman. Time, Brad, we'll just give her time. It's been a long time since Carmel and I became a family. We established the order in which we cooked in turn and opened a joint checking account. I was putting $400 a week on him, and Carmel was putting $200 on him. This account was used to pay for utilities and food expenses. We agreed to discuss any major purchases before they were made, although this was not necessary yet. I often stopped by Joe's place during my lunch break, but I always left early so Carmel could join me for a few minutes. Our relationship was very similar to that of a married couple, only we rarely quarreled and made love as often as we could. I fondly remembered our first dip in the jacuzzi and was grateful for the effective filter that we installed. Carmel has always been the best when it comes to intimacy. Perhaps it was due to the deep love I felt for her, which undoubtedly strengthened our physical bond. The only obstacle we faced was when Mandy stayed home on weekends and we needed her to look after the kids while we spent time together. Although Mandy most likely noticed it, she never talked about it. As time passed, Mandy's wedding was approaching, and she asked Carmel to be her bridesmaid. The gesture brought tears to Carmel's eyes, and she said she had never felt such a connection with friends and family before. Initially, Mandy wanted Molly to become her flower girl, but eventually chose one of her nieces for this role. The days leading up to the wedding were filled with chaos, as Mandy had just graduated from college and was busy organizing the wedding, with her friend acting as a bridesmaid. Fortunately, the weather improved, and I was able to open the pool to relax a little. While Mandy and Carmel were busy preparing for the wedding, I found solace in watching the children playing in the pool. It was a convenient distraction, allowing me to reflect on my relationship with Carmel as the wedding day approached. I loved these children very much and felt their love for me in return. I had a plan to surprise Carmel at the wedding, but it took several gifts for it to come true. Carmel and I haven't discussed the details of the wedding since Christmas, so I was hoping everything would go smoothly. On Mandy's wedding day, I wore a tuxedo because Brad and Rob were part of the wedding celebration. Janice and Gail also participated in the ceremony. Everyone was dressed to the highest standard. The wedding was about to begin, and Carmel was going to be busy as a bridesmaid. I got some free time, and eventually I started talking to Carmel's kids. I invited them to sit with me when the wedding ceremony starts. Mike, Mark, and Molly took seats in the front row, with Molly choosing to sit next to me. I reminded them to be quiet and enjoy the ceremony, as I would have to leave for a while to walk Mandy down the aisle. I hoped they would listen to my words. As the rest of the family gathered for the wedding, music started playing, and Ross, Brad, and Rob stood next to the priest at the entrance. Janice led them down the aisle. As she moved towards them, the children greeted her with a wave of their hand and a quiet, Hello, Aunt Janice. Gail followed suit, receiving an affectionate greeting in return. When their mother walked down the aisle, the children exclaimed with even more enthusiasm, Hello, Mommy, you are very beautiful. Carmel smiled and asked them to calm down a bit. She was followed by a flower girl and a ring bearer, Janice and Rob's children. The children kept waving at them, and both families were smiling. The music changed, and Mandy walked down the aisle with me. Tears of joy flowed down our faces as we reached the entrance to the church. Molly's voice rang out, exclaiming, Aunt Mandy looks like a princess! Laughter rippled through the crowd, and I saw the delighted grin on Mandy's face. It was the perfect compliment. Taking a step back, 
I sat down and looked up to see my family looking at me with love and support. At the ceremony, I was surrounded by the most important people in my life. Janice, my daughter, Gail, my sister-in-law, whom I cherished as my own, and my beloved girl, who held a special place in my heart, were here. Looking around, I saw my baby girl exchanging vows with her future husband, standing next to my son Brad and son-in-law Rob. My two grandchildren, who were a ring-bearer and a flower girl, attended the ceremony. My other two grandchildren sat with their grandparents, complimenting our loving family. At that moment, I felt truly blessed and grateful to have such a wonderful family. Each of them holds a special place in my heart. During the reception, the children stayed close to each other so that everyone would look after them. After we finished eating, the dancing started. As I was looking around the room, Carmela appeared and taking my hand, invited me to dance. I love you, Carmela, I whispered. I love you too, Dan, she replied. Surprised, I asked, are you sure, Carmel? Is that what you really want? Carmel assured me, yes, Dan, I really mean it. And she kissed me in front of everyone, a rare public display of affection for us. Usually, our kisses were left alone. The evening passed as usual, and now it's time to throw a bouquet. All the unmarried women eagerly gathered around, and Brad invited Carmela to join them, since she is not married. Feeling a little awkward, Carmel headed for the dance floor. When the countdown reached three, Mandy threw the bouquet directly at Carmel, causing some of the girls to playfully scream. After that, Mandy sat down and Ross took off her garter, eliciting applause from the men present when Mandy's thigh was exposed. After that, the single men were asked to take a garter and put it on the leg of the woman who received the bouquet. Carmela was the only one, no doubt. I was in the audience when Ross handed me the garter, apologizing that it belonged to his father-in-law. All eyes were on us, especially on Carmela, as I knelt down to put the garter on her leg. When I reached her hip, I stopped, taking out my wedding ring from my pocket. Already down on one knee, I made my move. Carmel, I've been waiting for this moment for another six months. Surrounded by our loved ones, I have a question for you. Will you marry me? There was silence in the room. Everyone was waiting for her answer. Suddenly Molly came forward, looking at her mother with tear-stained eyes, and urged her to say yes. Carmel, overwhelmed with emotion, confessed her love and willingness to spend her whole life with me. The audience burst into wild applause when Carmel accepted the offer. Mandy and Carmel hugged, tears streaming down their faces. It seemed that not a single eye in the hall remained dry. When I approached them, I realized that my own eyes were filled with emotions, and I bent down to kiss my future wife. We are happily married. Carmel left her job at Joe's Diner to help run the gas station and the store. Her presence was welcomed by everyone, as she brought a sense of family to the work. Molly affectionately calls me Dad, and boys sometimes switch from one name to another, perhaps to confuse their new friends. Reflecting on my life, I wonder how my family's life would have turned out if I had found out about Harvey many years ago. I also think about what would have happened to my family if Annie hadn't tragically died in that accident. Life is a delicate thing, and one mistake at the very beginning can change the course of the future indefinitely. Now, as I sit on the couch with my new wife, these thoughts haunt me. While my new family is playing on the floor, we hug and watch TV together. Today, we decided to watch a love story. Mark gave Mom the Titanic for Christmas, and we're all going to enjoy it together. Well, except for Molly. She always falls asleep halfway through. <laughs>